Welcome to Cynical Celluloid, where getting all you want isn't what you need. This episode we're looking at a film where sex is deadlier than God, and the only hope for happiness is a mutant warrior coming in and sweating on you. I wish I was kidding. A crimson bandoliered Connery takes on a society of immortals in John Borman's infamous sci-fi cult classic, Zarot. Zed, one of a violent warrior class called the Brutals, sneaks inside the monolithic head of Zardoz, where he shoots and kills Arthur Frayne, a man who seems to be controlling the floating godhead. The cranial craft autopilots itself back to base, taking Zed with it, and finding himself exploring the new place known as the Vortex, Zed is captured and made a slave, a scientific curiosity and an exhibit. Uniquely capable of learning among the Brutals, Zed finds out that these people are the Eternals, an elite gifted people cursed by their invention of the Tabernacle to have immortality. This elite could seem blessed, but there's trouble in paradise as their small society is in crisis, as its drive for a living is botting out. In a society where ageing is a punishment and sex is a throwback to a time where it was necessary, someone like Zed isn't just a physical threat. Is likely the only way out of purgatory. <laughs> Good swellers, double trick herself. <laughs> Zardoz, it's fair to say, is an odd film, not so much for what it is, but for what people perceive it to be. Made in 1973, largely on location in the beautiful Wicklow Hills in Ireland, it's one of those films I'd love to have seen the reaction of the original audience with. Starring a post-Bond Sean Connery who was looking for something to break the prison of his iconic role, it struggled to garner much love with audiences and critics who found themselves being largely baffled by this rather eccentric offering. To this day, Zardos is looked at with befuddlement, amusement, some mockery and a fair share of confusion, but it has found an audience, all with their own reasons for enjoying John Borman's quirky sci-fi. It is a somewhat baffling movie in many respects, a fact borne out by the opening to the movie, which was, to use Borman's own words, tacked on. In this edition, we have the quick and suitably strange primer to the film, which for me, well, I'm not sure it's helpful. Put it this way, I'd be fine if it wasn't there. That's not to kick off on a negative point, though, and soon enough we get into the world of the Brutals, and from the skies descends a strange, strange sight, the giant stone head of the god Zardos. It settles down in front of the Brigade of Brutals, a warrior class that terrorise and control, or rather cull, the people of the Wild Lands. Zardos's words are rather shocking. The gun is good. The gun is good! The penis is evil. He's not a loving, benevolent god, as he evangelises over the evils of reproduction and the virtue of the gun, right before vomiting supplies and ammunition and weapons. The penis is evil. The gun is good. This is why I say the introduction should be unnecessary. This opening really does set the scene quite well enough, in my opinion. The exposition that follows those infamous words does plenty to frame the world that we're in from the point of view of our lead character, Zed. But that's just one side of the story, and Zed's about to discover the other side. Sneaking onto the flying godhead craft, he's transported to the Vortex, but not before he kills the craft's controller, Arthur Frayne, an Eternal who's been using his god persona to control humanity outside of his Sanctuary of Vortex 4. When the ship lands, Zed explores for a while before being captured, and it seems the citizens of Vortex 4, a relic of the old High Society, are not happy with their lot. Zed presents a threat to their way of life, rekindling feelings that have been buried for centuries, and stoking a desire for something that only he can offer. Death. Well, there's a lot going on in this movie. Frankly, it often seems a bit cluttered as it bounces through several thematic elements, including sex, life, death, class systems and immortality, amongst others. It's a busy movie, to say the least, and not at all surprising that it left and leaves a large part of the audience behind, as these weighty topics move around in the story. We'll get to those thematic elements soon enough, but first we'll take a look at how the film itself presents 
and that's often as far as many get with Zardoz. The short story is, it's rather eccentric, and I don't say that as a negative judgement. Zardoz was, for one thing, modestly budgeted at over $1.5 million. Not an insignificant budget to be sure, but certainly low enough to cause challenges for Borman in a few regards, especially when around 20% of the budget went on paying Connery alone. That's not to make excuses, though. The film does require a little understanding. After all, Star Wars cost about $10 million more to make, and that was only a few years later on. So, visually, I would call this film quite incredible to look at. The locations, the landscapes, the quite exquisitely eccentric production design, and, of course, the one image that dominates the initial reaction to this film. A thing that draws both mockery and curiosity. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Zed. Drink it in. Appreciate Bond as you've never seen him before. Yup. It's a striking look to say the least, and one you may be surprised to hear I actually quite appreciate. Unironically. The look of Zardoz in general is one of extremes. This isn't a realist world. It even flirts with the surreal. This is to the extent I'm often reminded while watching this film in the 60s TV series, The Prisoner. The Prisoner, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a very oddly presented series that made frequent forays into psychedelic surreality. Stylistically, it shares a lot of similarities in its heightened ideas, characters, costumes and the filming locations, which in that case was Port Merion in Wales. It's a very eccentric pastiche of an Italian village. It looks uncannily just that little bit off, not in a way that you can quite put your finger on, but it's enough that it all feels a bit strange. That's how the production design of Zardos feels. It's not quite right, not in the sense that Borman should have done something else, but in the sense that it's all an oddly uncomfortable experience. This place, these people, these societies... They're all distillations of various uncomfortable ideas and the product of one tragically misguided one. Immortality. Zardoz is a bit of a multi-car pile-up of ideas, though. Stemming from two main inspirations, it goes on to pack in themes that really could be full stories in their own right, and this, rather than the stylistic choices, is what makes this movie a bit tough to get on with. The first of the two principal inspirations is the obvious one, The Wizard of Oz. The amusing thing is that Borman focuses on probably the most cynical interpretation of what the wizard is, and frankly, well frankly, I love it. Essentially focusing on the idea that the person pulling the strings, who is perceived as being magical, is instead a man, though with superior technology, it comes over as more a parody of what gods are taken to be. Immortal and powerful, all-knowing. Except these guys, despite their immortality, are clearly broken by their powers. Like with the wizard in Wizard of Oz, they're powerful, yes, but not all-powerful. More importantly, they're false gods, role-playing immortals that have stepped beyond their limits. As inspirations go, the Wizard of Oz only goes so far. It's a component of the story, but it's not the whole story. The second main influence was, according to Borman himself, Aldous Huxley's After Many a Summer, in which he talks about the extension of life and the moral ramifications of that. This is mixed in with the idea of a near-immortal society living so long that they've outlived their very desire to live, and it's the most important one in terms of the story. It's the driving force behind everything that goes on, after all. Frame takes on the role of part-time god and engineer of self-destruction of the Eternals, a wonderfully grotesque hubris that actually reflects certain aspects of the powerful in society. Hubris is actually a fascinating element of this film. For all the negative attention Zardoz gained at the time, and indeed over the years, it's something that is integral to what the film is, both in the characters and in the writing and direction. Borman himself commented on this, and yeah, he tried to do way too much, to be so comprehensive that the story gets tangled in itself. And well, there's a quality to the film that is a little self-important. Much of this comes from the heightened nature of how they play is and the stories present. Some of this is certainly part of the film's style. This near Gilliam-esque vision where characters are fairly extreme caricatures 
and where the events are on a hyperbolic level of ancient myths and men, along with an array of social, political and philosophical concerns. It certainly feels like it's trying to carry more weight than it can manage. It's hubris reflecting on hubris. The division of the society certainly bears this out. You have very clear lines of division throughout the cast of characters. There are the brutals, they're very manly men and only happy when they're killing, raping and pillaging. Then there's the Eternals, a somewhat matriarchal, at least more feminine society who have conquered death only to find out that their lives have no meaning anymore. And then there's the Apathetics, Eternals who have just given up on living but who cannot die. So on top of the man and god dynamic we now have a weighty multifaceted philosophical subject of the consequences of immortality on top of an examination of various aspects of the battle of the sexes including relationships, reproduction, male and female personalities and biological purpose. And that's amongst others. It has to be said given the breadth of things that the film touches upon it was probably impossible to really explore them all with the depth that they needed to have. It ends up feeling like many of these things that feel set up to catch your attention are so often only used as a way to nod to wider things but no more. As a bit of a tangent, George Lucas did this kind of thing as well, although far more often and far more egregiously in my opinion. The World of Zardoz is one where the world building and story hooks went too far, where the ideas outstrip the confines of what you can pack into a film. Though by Star Wars standards, particularly the prequel and sequel series of the films, Zardoz is a picture of restraint. It does at least not bloviate for three fairly long movies at a time. But the similarities between Borman and Lucas do strike me as interesting, because both struggle to eject ideas that get in the way. Ideas and world building become unkillable holy cows resulting in everything that can go in, going in. The result is almost always that yes, the world is rich with things, but so much of it becomes noise. This is essentially the same kind of problem that filming a story like Dune has, or indeed adapting Stephen King's stories. The latter example of King can clearly be seen in stories like It, The Stand, and most illustratively The Shining. The Shining is not a long story in its novel form, but King was upset at Kubrick's paring down of what went on the screen. For my money, as much as I enjoy the book of The Shining with all its deviations and focusing on certain character traits and so on, for the screen, Kubrick's version contains exactly enough to make it far leaner, more efficient and engaging for the movie format. True, some aspects of the original story have either been jettisoned or reduced, but as anyone who's seen the miniseries will be able to appreciate... There was a lot of baggage in that series that crippled the sense of pacing, and it certainly felt overindulgent. It was approaching four and a half hours long after all. The sequel Doctor Sleep by comparison was only two and a half hours in its director's cut and was approved of by King, and the source material was only just over a hundred pages longer than the novel of The Shining. Efficiency is not just about pandering to a critically simple audiences after all. The result of Borman's difficulty or reluctance to cut down some ideas does have a charm to it though. It certainly makes me like the guy in his passion. But it does make some of his films very much more slower and harder work to enjoy. The Exorcist 2 certainly struggled with this as well, though Deliverance showed what he can do with a very much more streamlined concept and story. As a writer, Borman is a little like his character Zed. Smart, proud, clearly educated, but prone to rampages, in this case creatively. I can of course relate to the latter. One of the most comprehensive readings of Zardoz really lays in the social and sexual politics of it though. I don't think it's unfair to say that this film is of its time. There's a full-on charge into the notions of masculinity, female and male roles, life, death, and the most basic steps in the cycle of existence. Zed is a raw male figure, he's violent and aggressively sexual. He represents the most primitive aspects of masculinity where the eternal society is, as Borman describes it, effete. The aesthetics, the community, both appearance and manner, uh, these all lean towards the feminine, or at least the genderless, though they do seem to be more matriarchally aligned. Unlike the Brutals, they don't often make physical contact with each other. 
favouring their psychic powers that they've developed, and sex is a mystery to them. After all, who needs reproduction when you're immortal? At least to the point where they can just grow a new you when you die. In contrast, the brutal society runs by violence. It embraces death and practices authoritarian rule over the lowest class, where the Eternals have no death. Everything is done by majority role, and they subsist through trading food for weapons, albeit by the dubious methods of persuasion. It sounds utopian in some ways, not a nice utopia, but some vision of such, until you realise that dissent in this world will relegate the offender to the status of renegade, where ageing is used as a punishment without parole. Zardus is certainly dabbling in political affairs. The numerous types of society certainly evoke that in its own right, and the Eternal's use of religion to manipulate the exterminators and the brutals speaks to its own ends. Though, when your film is political enough for a communist critic to ask you to sign a statement that you're not taking a piss out of Marx, then you can rest assured that there is something to your movie, however unclear it may be. Turns out, though, that this was largely the incidental likeness of Zardos's face being rather like Marx's. One imagines they weren't quite as suspicious of the way Sweet Movie used its representation of Marx, which is uncannily similar. It's also worth noting that the way that the society works in this movie is somewhat akin to an empire, what with the Eternals recruiting outsiders in another part of the world by using religion and arming the strongest tribes to suppress and rule them, forcing the Brutals to farm and gather resources for them. It's an unfortunate thing that the movie doesn't quite nail it all down, and aspects like the use of religion to control the unwashed masses becomes a mostly alluring device that only brush against the surface of what they allude to. It's almost to the point that one wonders what the communist critic was concerned about when frankly there are plenty of ideas in the movie that can most easily be interpreted as being critical of the ruling class. All along with a healthy dose of them only finding happiness through death at the hand of the working class. The political focus, as unflattering as it is for all involved, is actually most critical of the overlords and uh, lower class is the one to deliver reality to them. Courtesy of Frayne's plan, of course though the Brutals and Exterminators don't exactly get away scot-free either. In that regard, there are a number of ways to interpret the slant of the film, but oddly for me, I'm not as concerned about that in the way that I was with something like, say, Jeff Lieberman's Blue Sunshine, for instance. Partly this is because the politics are somewhat nebulous, a consequence of a rather messy story, but mostly it's because the more coherent philosophical ideas are more interesting to me, even if they do all too often run headlong into a brick wall on so many occasions. But mostly it's the ideas of life and death, desire and despair are the things that wash over the entirety of the movie most completely. The life of the exterminators and the brutals are all about life and death, or even life through death, where the Eternals had everything but death and were denying themselves the human experience of the cycle of life, including sex and reproduction. Both ends of this spectrum are rather extreme. It's not like Zed and his clan could even be considered heroic, rather they're barbaric murderers, slave drivers and even rapists. Zed is this, though he becomes something markedly different through education. Meanwhile, the Eternals are utterly dysfunctional emotionally speaking. They shut each other out physically and eschew sex, though when Friend resists they could be said to gang mind rape him. Zed's presence is as disruptive as some fear, and his mere presence moves even the apathetics of sexual awakening. Even his sweat is apparently a potent aphrodisiac. Really. Sex and death dominate the story in many forms, and for many reasons. It's always in the focus, and it always motivates and affects everything. The Eternals have eliminated death, only sparing near death for use as a punishment, while Zed, a sexually charged warrior, deals in death and is the only one who can bring it to a society who have irrevocably removed it from their grasp. But it's not one-sided by the end. Zed has changed. He realises that he can't go back to what he was. He's changed and refuses to kill a willing victim. As the film closes, Zed and Consuela flee from the carnage, and in a rather poetic montage, they begin a new society. The family that they would previously never have had the chance to start. This film has had a very, very unsympathetic audience for the most part. Zardas is an easy film to mock, and that's a terrible shame, really. 
The eccentricities of the production design, the flamboyance of some of the characters, and for those looking a bit deeper, the overload of ideas, including some that are overtly ambiguous or just downright dated, do leave the film open to criticism both fair and unfair. The thing is that Zardos is ambiguous enough that it's one of those films I solidly support many ideas of what the film represents, as it's quite exciting uh, and it's what makes the film so incredibly rewatchable. In fact, it's a must for this film if you want to get to the bottom of the film, or at least as close to the bottom of the film as you can get, indeed even if it has one, and even if you just want to get past the image of Connery in that uh, wild costume. To be honest, I think even Borman knew he had bitten off more than he could chew in many respects. He had simply gotten over-ambitious, something that he was prone to. I will say this, however, I wouldn't want it any other way when it comes to the film's making. Zardos, for all its flaws, more than earns its right to exist by virtue of being a huge effort to be something special. For me, it's a wonderful and strange gem that gets far too much casual dismissal from film pundits. As a technical exercise, it does occasionally show its rough edges. It's an early 70s film made on a modest budget after all, and sci-fi was not easy to pull off in the pre-CGI days. These, for me, as a fan of practical filmmaking, are as part of the charm. Things I can allow without the removal from the film's immersion for me. It's what I grew up with, after all. For a younger audience, or those so indoctrinated by Hollywood's obsession with computer-generated realities and hyper-expensive SFX budgets, it's going to take some getting used to. This said, Zardos has some stunning visual work that showcases Borman's exceptional talent for the cinematic. From practical in-camera sci-fi effects to stunning landscape shots, and just genuinely wonderful cinematography right across the board, it's clear to me that even when Borman drops a ball on the screenplay, he can deliver a cinematic experience that should see him stand far higher in film fans' reckoning than he probably does. The casting is outstanding, with wonderfully mad performances at one end to the perfect casting of Connery for the role of Zed at the other, with two great and likely the most grounded performances in the centre of it all, from Charlotte Rampling as Consuela and Sarah Kesselman as May. Connery, after all, was one of the most significant male sex symbols of the time, a picture of effortless hypermasculinity that feels only heightened slightly to fit Zed's persona. It's fitting that when Zed needs to sneak around while the Eternals' world is descending into chaos, they have to use drugs to reduce his manly attractiveness, whilst also feminising him, so he's not mobbed by the sex staff women and most probably the men that he passes. Connery did not like this scene. Borman had to do some gold medal persuasion Olympic shit to get him to put on a wedding dress. Suffice to say, Connery eventually did the job like a pro, and there are very few leading men in cinematic history who could pull off the Crimson Bandolier costume with as much authority as he did. And it works with him. These against type moments play into the character's arc perfectly. It is worth giving a nod to, as it's a matter of record, that Burt Reynolds was to take the role of Zed, only to have to pull out due to illness, and Connery, just as he stepped down from the Bond role, stepped in. Frankly, with no disrespect for Reynolds intended, this was a very lucky thing, as Connery kills this role. While Reynolds could have done it justice, considering how he handled this straight role in Deliverance, I can't help but feel Connery was a much better fit for the role. Burt Reynolds just never really struck me as being quite over the top as an alpha male figure as Connery could be, and that's as much to do with it being what Connery was like in real life, not just on screen. However, it is more than fair to direct some criticism at the direction on a few things. After all, there are some parts where things go so far over the top that even Borman admits it. For instance, the psychic communication all too often ends up looking like an avant-garde Amdram improv production, and characters like Arthur Frayne, as much as I adore the character, feel like they're out of a Monty Python sketch. That comment I made earlier about the film being Gilliam-esque? Frayne is largely responsible for that, though some of the visuals also contribute to it. And of course, there's the chaotic tone and cacophony of ideas that I've already discussed, which are ultimately what we got, and in its own right, the whole thing is still quite an experience. 
you will take away from this movie a lot of what you bring to it. Some will see a ridiculous spectacle while others will find and appreciate one or more of the things that the film is earnestly trying to do, even if it stumbles a lot on the way. I think it's safe to say that Zardoz is a faulty film, there's no revelation in that. It's in particular when it comes to the chaotic writing. But as misfires go, Zardoz is quite wonderful in its weirdness. If only more filmmakers took the kinds of chances that Borman took, then Western cinema would be far less bland and uninteresting as it is, and which it is increasingly becoming.